left off last time, sorry. Um, this is going to be our last video as part of the uh, cell signaling and cell cycle uh, kind of mini unit. And just some more information about that. I'm just going to kind of roll this kind of small mini unit that we did about cell signaling and uh, the cell cycle in with photosynthesis and uh, cellular respiration into a uh, cell processes unit. So we're not going to have um, a unit assessment on this just now. I mean, we just got everybody done with the, the cells one. So um, it'll be a little bit before uh, we have that. And then uh, just so you know, the cell cycle and cell signaling stuff and photosynthesis and cell respiration will be kind of on the same one, right? Just uh, to give you a plan for the future. So we were talking about um, last time the internal and the external signals that can push a cell past their checkpoints and into this uh, mitosis. And we were had just left off. You know, we had talked about cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, those internal signaling molecules. And we just left off talking about growth factors, those external signaling molecules, and that growth factors can be uh, density-dependent, so they're uh, released by other cells that prevent um, cell mitosis and regeneration when there's already too many cells in a given area. And... Um, that they are anchorage dependent, so that they require uh, to be touching another cell to be other, able to produce more cells. Right? You can't just have some like a cell floating through the bloodstream replicating, and all of a sudden it's clogging things up. So uh, some examples of uh, growth factors. Those were example. That's a, a name for those external signals. One's called platelet-derived growth factor, and this one is actually really important. So I turn that off because it's made by platelets um, in blood clots. And so one of the things that um, happens is this platelet derived growth factor is uh, sent out by a platelet that has, um, you know, uh, bound to some damaged tissue or who has started to form a clot. And it, it sends that out to uh, stimulate the cell division of other fibroblasts, which are connective tissues, to start to heal over that um, that injury and to recruit more platelets to, to come to that area to help uh, plug up the, the injury as well. So here's kind of a picture of... Um, kind of that happening if you uh, cut up kind of a sample of connective tissue in a small pieces in a petri dish um, and you kind of use that to obtain a free suspension of fibroblast um, then you are able to transfer them into ster st uh, sterile culture vessels and uh, in a basic growth medium plus the platelet derived growth factor the cells start to proliferate the to grow to fill up the container while without that platelet de derived growth factor just in a basic growth medium there's no division of those fibroblastic cells so this is an important growth factor that helps uh, form clots and to heal over wounds the last thing that we want to talk about is how all this relates to cancer because cancer is at its very base something goes wrong with the cell cycle all right cells proceed past checkpoints when they're not supposed to and so you have uh, a bunch of daughter cells uh, being made really really rapidly or you have cells that aren't exiting the cell cycle into the G0 phase like they're supposed to. Or you don't have cells dying when they're supposed to. So it's normally cells go through a normal life cycle and then 
they kind of are programmed to die uh, through a uh, process called apoptosis and in cancers that doesn't happen when it's supposed to anymore. So the idea is growth factors can create cancer. There are uh, certain genes, uh, segments of DNA, that are called proto-oncogenes. And they are genes for normal growth factor genes. All right? um, but those normal growth factor genes can become cancerous, or oncogenes. That's what we call a gene that might cause cancer to proliferate when they're mutated. So these proto-oncogenes normally uh, make DNA that, or these proto-oncogenes are normally segments of DNA that code for that are instructions to make growth factor proteins, you know, that we just talked about. But um, when they're mutated, they could cause cancer because they will start to stimulate the cell to divide even when they're not supposed to, right? And so um, an example of a proto-oncogene is the RAS gene, which activates cyclins. And if that gene is uh, stimulated to uh, or turned on when it's not supposed to, cyclins can be active and usher the cell through mitosis even when it wouldn't otherwise be appropriate to. And then there's a, another class of genes called tumor suppressor genes, which have a job of inhibiting cell division under the right situations. So it switches uh, off. If it switches switched off, if these tumor suppressor genes are mutated so that they no longer work, it can cause uh, cells to uh, not be stopped like at those checkpoints when they should be. And uh, p53, one of the most important genes uh, that has been researched in regards to cancer is a tumor suppressor gene. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it here in just a second. So we're going to look at a very basic idea about how cancer is related to cell, the cell cycle and cell growth. Um, so cancer is essentially a failure of, of cell division to be controlled. It's uh, occurring way too rapidly or at the wrong times or in the wrong places, all right? Um, it's unrestrained. It's basically the problem. It keeps growing and growing and growing and forms tumors and it, it disrupts many different tissues and organ systems potentially. But we want to talk about what specific controls, like we had already mentioned in the previous video, are lost to cause the development of a lot of cancers. Well, one of the big things that happen is these checkpoints um, no longer function, either because a um, tumor suppressor gene has uh, not been working, and now cells can proceed through them when they're not supposed to, or a growth factor is stimulating cells to divide at the wrong time. Now, that gene that we talked about, P53, that is a tumor suppressor gene that normally inhibits cell division um, under specific situations, plays a very key role in this G1S restriction checkpoint. That's kind of what it does. It's kind of the gatekeeper right here. It will stop cell division if it detects that DNA is damaged. So if it detects there's mutations in DNA, um, that the base is something's wrong with it, it will stop the cell from dividing until those things are fixed right here. So um, kind of like saying right here, if P53 does stop this cell at this checkpoint because there's damage in this DNA. It could stimulate the DNA to be repaired if that's possible. It could force uh, the cell into a G0 phase if there is, excuse me, really extensive damage. Um, it could just keep that cell there in G1 and just be arrested at that point. 
or if things are really bad, it could cause that cell to die. It could cause the program cell death of that damaged cell. Um, all cancers that we know of, all right, to some degree, have a shutdown in this p53 activity, which is really crazy. All cancers that we know of have some sort of misregulation in the p53 activity so that we have cells that are reproducing that are, are going through mitosis that have damages and mutations which can lead to a lot of the other abnormalities that we see in cancerous tissue so as an example here is a, a normal, okay, P53 gene. If DNA is damaged, the P53 protein will come into, uh, into enforcement and it will uh, trigger the, the cessation of cell division and enzymes to come in to repair the damaged d region of the DNA. If it is really, really, really uh, serious, it will also trigger the destruction of the cells so that they they can't reproduce. Or if the DNA is able to be repaired, it will uh, lift its inhibition over the G1S checkpoint and the cell will continue to be allowed to divide. In an abnormal case where there is a mutation with this DNA or there's damage to the DNA that encodes for P53 protein, if the DNA is damaged um, let's say by heat or radiation or chemicals or something like that, and there's a mutation in the DNA, the P53 protein is unable to stop the cell division and repair to the DNA. And so the cells divide without repairing their DNA. If the damage continues to accumulate, we can end up with cells that are cancerous, that are just keep going through that cell cycle unchecked. So, uh, in general, cancer develops only after a cell experience approximately seven or more key specific mutations. So, it's cumulative. It's not like, oh, there's one mutation and now you have cancer. It's, it's something that builds up over time. It's a cumulative effect of mutations in the DNA, which allow the cells to grow in an unlimited quantity and for an unlimited time. They don't exhibit anchorage dependence. They don't have to be attached to anything else to start to divide. And they're not density inhibited. So no matter how many cells are around them, they'll just keep growing and growing and growing. The last key thing about cancer is most of the time they don't die. Those cancerous cells don't die. They don't go through apoptosis when they're normally supposed to. So cells are accumulating, but none of them are dying. All right, they're just more and more and more being added on the top. Um, if you have some time, I'd actually just point out about this point that um, cancer cells can be almost immortal. They can divide for an unlimited amount of time. What's really interesting is that certain genes that are in charge of chromosomal maintenance get turned on which allows the cells to divide far uh, more than they normally would supposed to. And you're, if you're interested in kind of cancer research, I would, um, I would suggest that um, you read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks because it has a lot to do with uh, this specific part, the immortality of, of cancer cells um, and uh, 
I'm actually probably going to, during our Zoom call, going to do a shout-out for the book. I have it. It's a really great book um, that I think you should read. We might, we might actually read a few sections of it together. But from both a scientific and from uh, a, a social justice standpoint, that book is really, really important. And it has to do with what we're talking about right now. Um, cancer cells also promote blood vessels to grow called angiogenesis so they're able to grow new blood vessels around uh, tumor cells so that they can kind of take in as much of the body's nutrients as they can to promote more cell growth so if you look at it for a cancer to exist kind of like we know we 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 you know are are used to seeing it present in a medical case Look at all of the different things that have to be kind of switched on or turned off. So it is not a case of one mutation causes cancer. It's a cumulative effect. I just want to stress that so that we are more knowledgeable about what's actually happening. Now, what causes these mutations? Um, and these mutations can be, come from a lot of different places, radiation, chemical or radiation exposure, heat, excuse me, different carcinogens like cigarette smoke or chemicals or pollution or other things that are less controllable, but like your age or your genetics. And the important thing is, is that they are all cumulative which means the more you're exposed to any of these factors, the more likely it becomes that they um, cause more permanent or more or, or incorrectable uh, mutations in certain cells that could lead them to become cancerous. Ultimately, cancer develops into tumors, which are masses of abnormal cells. Now there can be benign ones which remain at their original site in a lump and kind of don't divide past that. Uh, and in most cases most of them don't cause serious problems um, and they can be removed by surgery. Not always but that's most most of the case. In other times they can become malignant, which means that they have left their original site. They're now reproducing and traveling through the body to places other than where they originated. In this case, they can be carried by blood vessels or the lymphatic system to other parts of your body. And when they do that, we call that, say that it, it uh, metastasizes. It's, it's in the process of metastasis where it's traveled through the blood or the lymphatic system and it's forming tumors in other places of the body besides where it originally started from. And then it can go on and impair functions of the organs throughout the body. The idea about treating cancer is to um, employ treatments that target and kill rapidly dividing cells. So cancer cells are going to be the most rapidly dividing in your body because there's no control over them whatsoever. And this is one of the reasons that the classical symptoms or side effects of cancer treatment um, appear. So for example, uh, radiation therapy kills rapidly dividing cells, chemotherapy, uh, is a uh, chemical agent that stops DNA replication in rapidly dividing cells um, and, and specifically stops mitosis and blood vessel growth. Now, if you think about some of the things that, like I was saying, are very, sorry, are very classical symptoms of cancer treatment, a lot of them have to do with targeting rapidly dividing cells because these treatments can't only target cancer cells. They target any rapidly dividing cells. So for example, one of the classical signs of being on chemotherapeutics or radiation therapy is losing your hair. 
hair cells, at least in the root, where it's still alive, divide very rapidly. And so these treatments only target rapidly dividing cells, no matter if they're cancerous or not. And so those cells are killed and people lose their hair. Another side effect is kind of being sick to your stomach. Think about it. Your stomach is filled with acid. And because of that, the lining of your stomach and your intestines need to replace themselves very frequently to withstand the harsh conditions in there. Okay? Because of that, they are rapidly dividing cells and are targeted by these treatments. All right? You know, there, there are really huge benefits of using these therapeutic treatments for cancer. But the idea, and what I want to explain to you, is, is they're not specific for cancer cells. Only, they're only specific for rapidly dividing cells, whether they're cancerous or not. So, um... One of the uh, really awesome uh, new things that uh, are being developed are drugs that target enzymes found only in cancer cells. And that's really the goal, right? The better we can target cancer cells, the lower doses we need, the fewer adverse side effects, and the more uh, efficiently these drugs can work. So uh, as an example of this, this drug, um, is a treatment for uh, leukemia and stomach cancer and it's the first successful drug that's been developed that with any high rate of specificity targets only cancer cells um, and uh, kind of a small infographic about how it works if this is um, a uh, enzyme that's involved in leukemia and it uh, activates a cancer protein. All right. There are ATP binding sites on this enzyme, which allows it to activate the cancer protein. This medication kind of gets into that binding site and disrupts the uh, binding of an additional ATP used to activate the cancer protein. Right, and this substance is specific to this enzyme you found in um, these cancers, and so that's super, super important and super, super awesome. All right, that's kind of all I wanted to talk to about to you about today. So I'm going to uh, stop this now, and we'll we'll uh, talk more in our synchronous session.